Okay, great. Yeah, we're on, we're on here. Well, um, I'm joined by Joe Paula Castro, co-founder of Cycle CPA, and today we're uh, having a conversation with Mike Callahan from Simple Growth. We're so excited to have you on, Mike. Uh, where are you? Um, you know, where are you located right now? <laughs> uh, right now, I'm actually working from the home office, uh, upstate New York. Um, that's where we've been pretty much throughout the years, even when I had the lawn care company. So, uh, yeah, kids, kids and wife are at, are at uh, work and uh, school. So I actually was able to work from home from the home office today and uh, uh, appreciate you guys having me on today. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, and I guess just to just to start, you know, I know you're doing a lot of great stuff with, you know, simple growth and helping with automations and you know, helping, helping businesses really, really streamline and be, be successful. But if, if you can give us a overview first of, you know, how, how did you get into the industry and, you know, about, you know, your, your initial uh, company? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, probably started out like most people watching um, high school, literally started pushing a push mower around the neighborhood, knocking on doors, um, trying to make money. So my parents, uh, blue collar family, really good, uh, background and just kind of work ethic instilled in uh, myself and my brother and um, literally said, hey, if you want to get a car and you want to drive a car, you need to pay for the insurance and pay for the car for yourself. So um, I wanted the vehicle. So I went out and literally started knocking on doors and asking people to cut their lawns. And uh, that was freshman year in high school. And then um, obviously through high school, we had uh, probably about two crews I had. I was working basically full time through college, playing junior hockey up in Canada uh, in the winters. And then uh, through my college stint, five years um, through college business uh, degree, um, basically went in and it, it basically by junior or senior year in college, uh, third or fourth year in college, I had three full-time crews and probably seven or eight full-time employees. So I'll never forget. I went into uh, one of my finance exams and um, went into the profession and said, Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? He's like, sure. What's up? You know, are you unprepared for the test or something? I go, no, I'm, I'm prepared. I go, here's the thing though. There's two hours after the test is done. I got to take off. I've got a couple trucks on the road plowing snow and I got to go join my employees. And the guy kind of looked at me sideways and was like, what are you talking about? I go, well, I, I own a business and I've got several employees and we've got about half a foot of snow outside. So he kind of looked at me and chuckled. He goes, get out of here. He goes, you're more, you know, you're more motivated than half the people in this class. Um, and then when I came back the next week, he ended up giving me an A on the a test and then didn't have to take it. So uh, kind of where I'm going through this is just, you know, just like anybody else, uh, didn't really go out to start a lawn care landscape or snow removal business. Um, but I saw that dream of what it could be, the self-employment, looking at my dad working in corporate America and some of the struggles he was having with it as far as the politics and things like that. Um, so when I graduated college, it was either the fork in the road and we go the entrepreneur route or we go to the, you know, basically the corporate route with the rest of my buddies. And at that point, I'd been making significantly more money throughout college than I would have been for my starting offer. So you can kind of guess the road I took was the entrepreneurial road with uh, Callahan's Lawn Care. So one of the biggest things I think looking at that, though, um, yes, I think college is needed. I, I don't think it's necessarily all it's cracked up to be. It's good for time management. Um, it's really good for getting those foundational understandings, but work ethic, figuring out what you got to do. But really, the, the learning really starts when you actually get out in the real world. And unfortunately for me, and I think probably for everybody else, including those entrepreneurial classes I took in college, um, they didn't really teach you how to run a business. And what I took away from my business um, that I was currently running, the other people that I admired that had really successful multi-million dollar businesses that the family knew or in the ecosystem of people I inter intermingled with, um, and the college professors, believe it or not, that owned their own businesses were teaching these classes. It seemed like the business owner should be the single cog in the wheel that all the business relied on. And that's how you build a successful business. You work 100 hours a week um, and, and that business revolves around you. And, and what I found to be is that really was not the truth at all. Um, so fast forward, probably five or six years after college, ended up getting married to a girl I was with in high school. And uh, believe it or not, on Valentine's Day, she came home and literally said, Mike, I'm out of here. This business is running your life. So uh, obviously hit some turbulence, rocky bottom at that point, but kind of looked around and said, you know, the self-assessment of the business, my life, where I was at. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of things I like in my life. And one thing I really don't like is this lawn care and snow removal business. It was profitable and it was working okay, but it, it literally, I was a slave to this thing. I couldn't leave for a day or two because the thing would have fell apart. 
So I literally searched on the internet how to get your life back from your business. And what I had fell into was right around that time, Tim Ferriss and the four hour week work, work, work week had just came out. And instantly I was like, wow, that looks pretty interesting. So I continued to dive around throughout the middle of the night and uh, found an automation platform. At that point, it was called Infusionsoft. Now it's called Keep. They've rebranded, uh, but absolutely no technology background at all. I went out and bought an automation platform. And with that automation platform, uh, I went to bed thinking that I literally was going to be running this lawn care and snow removal company from the beaches of Thailand and Bali. Well, obviously, I woke up the next morning and was like, hmm, probably not going to happen. Quite. <laughs> so that started my journey on automations. And um, in the following five to six years, I had traveled to U.S., Canada, and then met up with a gentleman in Brazil. Um, and I sought out the experts in automations and automating the business. And there was different areas. So people were... Um, basically experts in email marketing, text message marketing, SMS, um, upsells, whatever that was, I went out and sought that expert. But the thing that I think I got really lucky enough along my journey was, is I didn't try to do it all at once. I said, okay, what is the biggest pain point that's going to start buying some time back and systematize this business? And I focused on it. And that's where we started to automate the business. Um, but through that automation process, um, when we talk about it a little bit later today, probably there's a lot of things I want to share, but I think the biggest thing, if you're just getting into automations is that we look at this grand picture and we think we're going to automate it. And, and quite honestly, through that journey, I was working hundred hours a week. Then I went down to five to six hours a week and then literally became an absentee owner for 30 days at a pop and the business ran itself. And then eventually when the business got acquired, um, probably about two and a half, three years ago, ballpark. When I signed that paper, I left because that business was basically a franchise of franchise fees. It was a turnkey solution for sales, marketing, employee recruitment, training, onboarding, and repetitive tasks. Um, but the way you could build a, a system like that is thinking about the perfect path. And that's what we all dream of. So if you look at the biggest thing right now is recruiting and training and hiring and retaining employees around. The labor market is, is brutal. Um, but if you look at it, in my opinion, I'm going to go out, I'm going to put an ad on your Facebook, Craigslist, Indeed, wherever you get employees, they're going to hire, they're going to fill out that ad. They're going to be sorted out. They're going to be qualified. Then we're going to have someone call them, reach out for a, uh, an appointment or basically an interview online or now virtually, or maybe they hit an online booking page and they book their own. Okay. They're going to show up. The interview is going to go great. And we end up hiring them. Then we're going to train them. They're going to show up. We're going to get them through the tax documents, everything else we need. And they're going to be part of the team. We're setting up our quarterly reviews and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but what happens if they don't show up to that interview? What happens if we train them and they're just a bad fit and we have to fire them? What if we train them and they're a great fit and somebody basically grabs them and pays them more money? And they just go cold. Or we go through this whole entire process. We get them in for a month. And they're going, but then they just don't work out if they leave us. So there's all these perfect paths. But when you build an automated system, you got to think about all the things along the way that don't happen. And that's where most people fall short because we all can think about the perfect path. But what about the reality of all these other holes that are basically falling through the system? So um, that's kind of my, my recap. And then uh, basically after we got acquired, um, we really weren't even for sale the old saying that when the price is right, the price is right. It's going to be for sale. Um, these crazy Facebook and YouTube videos that we're doing actually attracted some uh, acquisition. Then we shopped it locally to kind of build the price up um, and ended up with a local uh, buyer because we knew based on the buyout that we could definitely get our hands on the finances if they fell short on the payment, but everything worked out fine there. Uh, but we'd started this little kind of passion project called Simple Growth. And the mission of it still today is to help small business owners, specifically service business owners, take their life back from their business through using an automation platform, or hopefully help them avoid the pitfalls that I had and basically create a system that doesn't revolve around so they don't have to take their life back from the business because they have a life with family and friends and whatever that is that drives you outside your business. Wow. No, there's, there's a lot of things to unpack there. Like, um, you know, I, I love the fact how, how you mentioned that you know, oftentimes in school, it, the focus is not necessarily on, um, you know, building building business owners, um, and and I think it's it, it's kind of interesting how how you you kind of learned that kind of the hard way, um, you know. Now now you're taking that to to now help other other business owners, um, and so 
I know you had touched on, you know, it, it can get overwhelming. And I know even at, at the accounting firm, Carl and I are implementing a, a CRM right now. What, what would you recommend for someone that maybe they're 200 to $400,000 in revenue starting up their business? And, um, you know, I, I, I guess in the terms of, you know, not being overwhelmed and not doing everything at once, what, what's a good starting point for, for someone like that? Joe, that's, that's a great question. So you mentioned somewhere between two and 400,000 in sales. So if you're looking at, I kind of like to look at the stages of business. So traditionally, you're looking at a normal service business, really any other business at that point, there's about five stages of business. So you've got stage one, which I like to break into one A and one B. So one A, you're kind of, you've got a part-time job that on the side at your business, you're working for somebody full-time. One B, you've kind of said the health of man, I'm making money. This guy's getting rich off my blood, sweat, and tears. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to make the money I deserve, which none of us really know, have, have any idea what we're getting to at that point. But we, you know, we're done working for the man. We're going to go make some money and prove, prove everybody wrong. And there's certain points at that. So now you're trying to create a solid business in that one B. Now, when you go to two, there's a, there's a, there's a problem or a pain point in the business. And there's different growth plateaus throughout your series to hit a million and obviously well beyond, but only about seven to eight percent of all lawn care or home cleaning business service business ever break a million. And I think the stats are actually a little lower than that now. So your your part of success of the year is pretty tough. But as you're going into two stage two, it's really going in. Your biggest pain point is how do we go and actually get leads? That's the biggest pain point. As we're going into stage three, now it's like, how do we create a scalable sales system that's predictable with profits and estimating? Stage four is, okay, now we're starting to build systems and processes that can be delegated that don't revolve around the business owner. And then stage five is how do we build this leadership system? So if the business owner, my true belief, should be doing the strategy, the mission, the vision, the values. Now, how do we implement that? Add a five to eight to ten million dollar business below us, so we're actually replicating the mission, vision, values, the culture of the leader below them. So we have multiple kind of mini leaders below you, and that flat organization is getting higher. But if you're looking at that five to seven hundred dollar mark or two to five hundred dollar mark, really, you're going out and you're going out and figuring out how to attain leads, and then how to actually build market density. And then how do we figure out a sales system? So very similar like Dylan on the Simple Grow team, who was actually our first client, multi-million dollar lawn care and snow removal company in Sudbury. Dylan and I talk about like, man, it was like when we flipped that light bulb and we figured out how to do every door direct mailing, or we had figured out how to do upsell emails. Um, and there's a handful of the different things that we did. Um, and we didn't know each other at that point, but we figured out these key little things. It was like the floodgates opened. So I would figure out it, it, that 200,000 mark, how do we go out and systematically get leads? And when you're doing that, whether you're automating or not, we want to figure out lead source acquisition. Where did that lead come from? So is it Facebook? Is it Home Advisor? Is it customer referral? Is it they saw your truck? Was it word of mouth? And as we track those, we want to know how many people came from each marketing source and then how many converted into a client. And then what, how long did they stay with us? What is our client lifetime value? So a real basic example right now is if we've got a lead coming from Facebook, we're doing paid ads and that lead costs us approximately 125 bucks on average to get them in and convert them into a client. So we should know with the stats, what's our closing percentage. So maybe 30% of all leads turn into a client and 125 bucks is the average cost to get that client. So that's that two to $400,000 mark. I, I want to know that number. And then maybe home advisor, I got that lead for 25 to 30 bucks. Uh, but the client lifetime value for that one time job, I'm getting home advised, maybe worth 250 bucks. So it's costing me 30, I'm generating 250. Where that, that Facebook lead is probably about 100 to 125, but they're generating 12 to $15,000 in lifetime value. So now we kind of see all marketing sources are not created equal. And uh, Jonathan Petoshnik of the Lawn Care Millionaire uh, co founder of Service Autopilot. Uh, uses analogy. So I got to cre credit where credit's due, but the analogy is very interesting. And I live by this analogy. It's kind of like a Coke machine. Imagine all your clients are sitting in there and each one of those buttons is a different lead source. So you stick your hundred dollar bill in there and you click the button and out the bottom clicks out that client. And you know, on average, how long they're going to last and how much they're worth. So Joe and Carly asked me, how much are you going to spend for a client? And if I know the cost, every, every penny I can spend within my budget, I'm going to drop it in that machine and watch him kick out. So that would be that two to 300,000, maybe $500,000 advice. 
And in addition, when we're bringing those leads in, we also want to track our cancellation because cancellation is inevitable, no matter how good you are. So let's say it's not your fault, but in your market, maybe you're down in the Carolinas and it's blowing up. Maybe you're losing 10 to 15% of your client base every year through attrition. They're just leaving the market. So you need to know what is basically dropping out of the bottom of that sales funnel, whether they're canceling because they don't like it or they're just leaving. So we're pumping these leads in and we're hopefully keeping them in there and servicing them. But the ones dropping out, we got to build into that marketing plan. So that would be the first piece of advice. The second piece is we get to that half million or a little bit bigger, maybe even before if you're, if you're really proactive, is we've got to figure out a systemized way to estimate with, estimate with no emotion. So there's three ways of estimating we always see when we come in to a service business. And I am not on a pedestal of preaching because I've made every possible mistake or got lucky enough to get it right the first time. But we all get in business. We go out. We, let's use a lawn mowing example. We go to the yard and we look at it and we look at it and we say, our market, that's a $55 cut, mow, blow, and edge. So I'm going to charge 55 bucks. Probably not the right way to do it, but that's how we all start. Next step is I like to call guesstimating. So you're looking at it and you're guessing how long, based on your experience, it's going to take. And hopefully not emotionally. So if you think it's going to take an hour and your goal is 65 bucks an hour, an hour times 65, it's a $65 cut. But we all know like, hey, it's the springtime. I need to get these lawns. If, if I go 60 bucks instead of 65, I probably should get that account. So now we're in it unintentionally stealing from ourselves. And then the final step is a production rate based estimate. So it's based on square footage, linear feet, number of small, medium, large shrubs. So we need to go in, the next hurdle is we got the sales part and the lead part. Next part is we need to dial in our estimating that's non-emotional, has predictable profits and can be delegated. Now, once we've figured out the leads and the marketing and we can go out and delegate estimates or if we're still doing them ourselves or non-emotional, we know they're profitable, then we got a system that we can scale. But a lot of times it's pretty scary. We're working with two, $3 million companies to simple growth they don't know their client acquisition costs. They don't know what it costs to operate. And they've just been in such a good market and lucky enough, they're throwing it at the wall. And, and that's what scares me because I, I've been there. It's like playing Russian roulette with your financial future. And if you got a family, I mean, that's where you're at. And once in a while, you're going to hit that chamber when it's full and it's going to hit you in the face. Um, so that, that would be my suggestion. Figure out the lead part, the acquisition cost, the closing ratio. Now your sales thing's dialed in. It's a math game. I pump this amount of money in here. I send these out. This is what I get in the end. And then once you figure that out, we're in the process that we really got to start dialing in that system for estimating and then job costing. Daily and weekly, we need to be running the numbers on those accounts. Are we hitting that average goal? If not, not emotionally, at least twice a year, I got to raise that price up because if I'm showing up to your house, Carla, and, and I'm losing 20 bucks every time I mow the lawn, I might as well just drop a $20 bill off at the front door and leave. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So a lot of people are like, well, if I raise my prices, they're going to leave. Does it really matter? You're losing 20 bucks every time you show up. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's that emotional thing. Um, I'll, I'll remember, never forget, I had the 80-year-old lady behind my parents' house. It was my first client. I wouldn't raise her prices for like 10 years because emotionally, you know, it was Mrs. Rafisi. I mean, like that lady gave me business. <laughs> got me a business. So eventually what we did is we exported to an Excel sheet and raise the numbers. And I, I highlighted the names and addresses in black in the Excel sheet. I ran the formula and I gave it to Tani and Christine in the office and they raised the prices and I didn't see it for a week. Wouldn't let, they said, I don't want to see it. <laughs> raise the prices. And, and, and good old Grace came back. We raised her price. She wasn't happy, but um, <laughs> that's a true story. I mean, that's literally, but we get really emotionally tied to these clients in the early years and we're scared to make that move. But if we're not making money, yeah. You, you might as well be the greeter at Walmart. It's, you're probably making more money, a lot less stress. Uh, we yeah. get in business and not to be materialistic, to make money. That's why we do it. So if you're not doing it, you've got to make those game time decisions, I guess. Yeah, that's that's the whole point of a business. That's that's why you have the business, like you said. And so so that's, that's great. Um, so you have your sales and marketing, you know, streamlined and set up for your business. After that, you have the estimating. So somebody could replicate it and come up with great estimates. And you're monitoring that with job costing to make any adjustments and pivot at any moment. And um, once you have those two set up, I'm sure now you're going to need some employees, right? Because now you have your sales and marketing, which, you know, increases revenue. You need more employees. So, um I know that, you know, you're an advocate for pay for performance and 
um, how how did that really um, build into the recruiting and retention for for those employees? Do you think, Mike? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about it. So it's something we've been doing uh, in my company. We did it for probably about 12 to 15 years, um, and it, it's a scary commitment. So just to go back to our estimating and our production rates, yeah, I, I will warn, warn, and warn. Do not attempt pay performance or what it used to be called uh, less popular piece rate, uh, but you're paying by the budgeted hours with quality control. Unless you have your estimating dialed in and your non-billable drive time, shop time, meetings, those times must be accounted for very accurately within your budgeting and your scheduling with transparency, or you will have a mutiny. So if you think the labor market is bad now, it is not. If you implement this now, you will have a straight up mutiny. So I just gonna before I get into it, yeah. public service announcement. Mr. Warner, <laughs> if you're estimating the <laughs> you need to have budgeted time on every job, the non-billable drive time, even if you're using a consultant around a um, financial, your overhead break even number and your per hour revenue number should include that non-billable drive time. Just make sure you're including it. You don't have to charge for it necessarily, but it needs to be included. Um, because you, you will have immunity. But if you have got all that dialed in, it is an awesome thing to do. Main reason right now, especially, is it is going to be a recruiting and not only a recruiting tool, but a retaining tool for your existing employees. Because right now I'm still driving around town. There's $5,000 signing bonus banners all over the fences outside of all the warehouses and places around here. So if you think you're cozy with your employees right now, they're seeing those signs. We need to have some kind of way to get them and get them to be loyal and reward them. Uh, so kind of said my piece about that, it's going to, let's deal with the, the retention part and then we'll actually do with the recruiting part. So the retention part is going in and what you're doing is creating your own little business uh, for your employee within yours. Now, the major benefit is it's going to fix your labor costs, which is probably your biggest expense in your business and probably the biggest risk you have. So it's probably gonna run about 60% of your, your expenses is your labor, we're fixing it. Now, the biggest thing on the street is with piece rate, you don't have to pay overtime. You legally do and you legally should. So if you're looking at piece rate as a way to avoid overtime, you're not going into it the right way. The idea here is that we wanna fix those labor costs and reward our employees for being more productive and making smarter decisions. And the key is with quality control. We implemented it wrong the first time when we did it, and it was production and everything. The guys were off to the races, but quality right down. We started having cancellations. So we had to reinvent the way we implemented it. So we have uh, budgeted time with quality, internal inspections, and uh, input from our client base. We're going to put it on a TV or dry erase board on the actual shop wall. And it's not going to be how many hours each person was budgeted because it's going to create animosity. Joe, it might be in the middle of summer and you're like, it's not fair. Carla's working only 20 hours this week and I've got 40 and it's hot and it stinks. And then Carla might be like, well, it's not fair. Joe's getting 100 hours this week with overtime and I only got 30. Let's face it, we're not going to make anybody happy. So what we did is created a process based on a percentage. 100%, you were hitting your budgeted time. I can tell anybody, you did a great job. You hit 100% with a quality control. If you beat your budgeted time by 10%, you were 10% below, that actually comes out as 110% the way we did it. Because now I can go to anybody and say, you gave 110%, you did better than what you're supposed to with a quality constraint. If I came to you today and said, hey, you guys only did 65% with a quality control constraint, you know you didn't give 100%. But now if you were budgeted five hours a week or 100, it's an apples to apples comparison. It eliminates people having animosity based on not enough hours or too many. And then... We're going to track that daily, and then on the following Monday, we're going to have a huddle and basically have public transparency about it. And at the end of the month, we reward the, the crew or crews, depending on the vision, with something tangible, uh, pre-COVID at least, with something they can actually use. It wasn't a gift card for the grocery store or something. It was literally to go to the movies or whatever that was. They had to physically go out and use it, so they actually took that reward and we were able to share it with their friends or family. They actually had to spend time to actually enjoy it, so it was that connection. Yeah. Uh, that that was huge internally. And then the other biggest issue is uh, a lot of times our employees are not accountable for what they should be doing. So Carlos on the team was notorious for driving all the way to the other side of the town and forgetting his weed whackers and blowers because all our trucks were loaded, gassed, and they had five to 10 minutes budgeted to check the oil and just make sure everything was on the truck on all the equipment. 
So he got all the way out to the east side after just before rush hour, calls me, Mike, don't have any weed whackers at Blower. And normally I would run in the car or truck and run across town to get it to him because I didn't want two guys sitting there, you know, costing me money. So I said, hey, Carlos, where, where are we at? Like, what was your shop time? Did you finish that? Yeah, it was like 7, 7 five. Unfortunately, I can't come out. He goes, what do you mean? Because I already paid you for that time. You were paid to check that job and you didn't do it. Well, you didn't do it well if you did do it. So he had to drive back in rush hour, get the stuff, drive all the way back. Took him about two hours round trip. And it just, when he got back to the shop, he told everybody. And it just, it was like fire. It went through the whole entire organization. Next morning, most of the crew members were there early, loading their stuff up. And ever since then, the story got better and better and better. And year after year. But that created a culture of accountability and that we paid you for that job. And same thing, if you didn't blow off a patio on a house, I paid you for it. So you're going to go back and do that within that budgeted time to get done. So you fix that labor cost and held those guys accountable. They're normally not on hourly because most guys are waiting to 40 hours and just keeping a pulse to start hitting that overtime. Yeah. So internally, you should, what we had is about two, but a, a 32 to 34 week season. We were guys were averaging about 2,500 to maybe 2,200 up and above time and a half for, for um, overtime. So the goal was to pay them more and let them be efficient. And like Carlos one day, um, I'll pick on him. Good guy. Uh, but he, we were backed up Monday and Tuesday. So he was cutting Monday and Tuesday's lawns on Tuesday. He worked to like seven or eight o'clock at night. And he called me. He's like, Hey boss, I got both days done. Um, you know, technically I should be getting paid to midnight or one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, was well, everything done with the quality control? Yep. Everything's good. I go, yeah. Like, while you're home, you're technically going to be making that hourly wage for the next four hours. Same thing came back into the shop and it was like, and it was right in the early days of the piece rate. So people were like, they bought into it. Um, and those are the little wins that you need to have. Yeah. But on the flip side, if you're going out recruiting employees, man, it's an interesting conversation in that inter interview that you go in and show them what the hourly rate is and what they could be making on piece rate. And if you have the right individual on the right seat, on the right bus, man, it's magic. Because then you're like, hey, yeah, you're starting at 15 bucks an hour. But really, on average, most of our guys and girls in the field do based on this kind of productivity with your experience, instead of 15, you're probably going to be between 18 and 19 an hour before we even get to overtime and the light comes on. And then the other people that come in the interview, you're going to see it's not a good cultural fit because we're really going in and showing them what's expected, all the good things. But at the end, end of the interview, I had pictures of a guy hedge trimming a probably a quarter mile hedge row at 90 degrees. Guy looked like he was dying. But we literally, we said, hey, these are the things you're getting into outside of these great things. So we kind of weeded out you know, the wrong fit as well. Yeah. We had one guy shoveling snow in a sleet storm. He looked like he had ice coming off his beard. But I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, no problem. We've done this. Or like, yeah, this isn't for me. I'm all good. Um, but we had basically a slideshow that actually showed the pros and cons piece rate and what it was all about. And through that, those good employees that were good culture of fit seem to be hanging out with the same type of individuals. Um, even a lot of guys from Guatemala that we brought in from our H2B program, uh, we guys would volunteer to take them to church on Sundays and they would actually start recruiting um, the other basically uh, American people at that church to come work for the team because they were telling about all the good things we we're doing and the culture and the peace rate. And that peace rate um, was something that they absolutely loved. So it's not only a, a retention tool, but it's a really good recruiting tool for the right type of individual. If you want to go out and build a culture around smart work and um, quality. That's great. And the, the transparency that, that you give to the employees with that process. And, you know, I, I, I love how in this case, you know, in, in the way that, that you laid it out was, yeah, it's okay. You know, we can, we can pay you for your performance, but you know, keyword performance, you know, you have to be performing, um, you know, so I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great method, Mike. And, you know, thanks for thanks for laying out all the all the details there. Um, and if there's if there's any last items before we go for today that that you'd like to leave the audience with. Yeah, I think it's just really we need to, especially today um, in today's world right now with the labor shortage, we need to not be uh, combative with the employees. That's where that piece rate, that pay performance comes into play. So it's no longer the management yelling at these guys or girls and you got to speed up, you got to do this. Now I'm on their team. So I'm looking at them going, hey, Carla, Joe, how can I make you more successful? How can we put more money in your pocket? Is your goal to be out by three o'clock to hang out with your kids? 
when they get off the bus? Or is your goal to work to five or six o'clock a day, working 10 hour days to make as much money and put it in your pocket? Now there's a minimum I got to make as a business owner, but now we're on the same page. We're having these conversations we never had. Um, and, and it's just really beneficial. And now when you've got a guy or girl stopping at Dunkin' Donuts or Tim Hortons or something for a coffee every morning and running into that rush hour track, if it coming into you, like we had one guy come in and he goes, it's impossible. I can never meet the budget of time. You know, this, this system doesn't work. It, it's a lot but easier conversation to say, how can I make this profitable for you than screaming at the guy for stopping for coffee? And then inevitably he doesn't realize he's running into traffic and literally causing his own pains along the way. And it's self-defeating. Like if you want that coffee, get it before you come into work. Or if you're really going to do it, get to the other side of town, beat rush hour, because we've systematically brought you in in time to beat it. Um, but a lot of times employees or team members don't see it that way. It's just a coffee. But now I sat down with the guy, the guy's name was Garrett. I said, Garrett, what do, you, what do you think that coffee stop is costing you of pay that you would have got paid while you're at home instead of being in rush hour? It was, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks, 200 bucks for the year. We did the math. It was a sixteen to seventeen hundred dollar coffee stop that it was wow. costing, and then the light bulb came on. But now I'm helping him. I'm not yelling at him. But now he's like ownership. So I think that we really need to adapt that culture. How can we go in and help and support our our our, um, our team members? And that's what we adopted at Callahan's Lawn Care. We we went in and we, our kind of our, our our mission was giving people the lifestyle they desire. It was twofold. It was our clients so they could go spend the time, their kids baseball or soccer game and not have to worry about the landscape. But the other side was our internal employees. And that kind of came from the piece rate. That idea is how can I give Carla and Joe, if you're on the team, how can I give you the lifestyle you desire? And how can we work together to attain that goal together and get you what you need, the client needs and keep a, a solid company that's profitable and continue to run and support you. I really like that shift in the conversation and the way that that goes definitely does make a difference. And you know, we've we've hit on a lot of key topics today, a lot of valuable information, and we unpacked a lot of that. But if anybody wants to talk with you more about automations and how they could get started and or even more information on that, what is the best way that they could reach you, Mike? Yeah, probably the best bet is uh, the website, simple growth systems with an S.com um, or give our office a call. We've got a full time team. Um, that's, a, you know, basically run from 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. Eastern to 10 p.m. Eastern as far as our help and support, but our main sales and uh, main core team is between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern. But if you give us a call or uh, simple growth systems with an S.com, Dylan on team is also run a multi-million dollar company, Virginia, uh, Chad, uh, they're all part of the team now. They're all work past clients, um, but we're given a, a free, basically business audit and we'll go in in 15 minutes and literally break down, kind of like you mentioned, what's the growth hurdle between 200 and 500? We're going to go to your specific business and say, hey, what's the next growth hurdle or pain point that you're going to experience? Right. Where do you want to be? And these are the four to five things, literally, we give you a PDF that nails it down with solutions. How do we overcome that growth hurdle? So we're going to blast past it and not feel the pain point. So simplegrowthsystems.com, uh, book a free call with Dylan or myself, Virginia or Chad, and we'll give you a free audit and um, no sales pitch. And then it, it literally, it's just kind of, hey, let's pay it forward. And crush it out in 2022. Wow, that's great. Yeah, we'll have um, a link to your website here in the comment section. And I want to thank you again, Mike. This was great. Yeah, you guys are awesome. I love what you're doing for the uh, the, the industry, the expertise. Sorry, I didn't see you guys at GIE, but I am back on the road officially in February at uh, Martha Woodward's Quality Driven Software. And I'm doing a full day free event for anybody using Service Autopilot or looking to use it. Um, it's going to be in San Diego. So if you hit our website and ask the team. Uh, it's going to be eight hour, literally deep dive into automating, job costing, estimating, and pretty much everything else. So it's going to be an action packed eight hours for free. Awesome. Wow, cool. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I can't wait to get back on the road, not stuck in the team anymore. And you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you again, Mike. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Mike.